Bowles. I'm going to do an interview with him. So I want to go back in time a bit. I want to go to the pre-LCS era because a lot of people probably don't know this, but you actually played at Lands. You played in like the, the scene back when, okay, the famous teams were like CLG, TSM, but you were playing back in the day with some players that people will know actually, Man Cloud, these sorts of people. You were in this team, right? Can you, can you give me kind of some of the, the background there? Well, I think I played a lot of solo queue and then I met some friends that knew Man Cloud. I think Lemon God and Smithy. Yep. And I ended up trying out for them since I asked my friend if they could get a trial for me. Then I was trying out as AD carry first and I was playing Ash at that time or something. But yeah, I tried out for them. They liked it and I just joined them. And that's just how I started playing with them. I think our team was called a Picture of a Goose. Yep. So one of the reasons why that's actually an interesting storyline, I think, though, is because obviously some of those players became, at one point, like the direct rivals of Cloud9. When Cloud9 was on top, people forget the one team that could actually beat Cloud9 wasn't TSM. It was a, a, one that became XTG Vulcan at the time, right? Was it strange to then play against them in LCS? Yeah, it was really strange because I think right before they made LCS, I left their team and I was just uh, subbing for other teams and stuff just uh, focusing on school and just playing casually. But then uh, I subbed for Meet Playground, a team that was trying to qualify for LCS. And then it just turned out that I think uh, Mancloud was, uh, and Zuna was uh, also qualifying. And then uh, it ended up that uh, they beat us and they made LCS. Then uh, I just laid back for a while until Hai asked me to join Cloud9 and that just happened. So like you said there, one of the other interesting things was there was a period in time when actually, I remember reading an, an old AMA and you were like, you'd given up, you weren't going to play top lane, you thought like that role sucked, you wanted to play AD carry instead. If, if the right team had come along, would you just be like a professional AD carry player now? Would, was it just a phase? I think I definitely did hate top lane that time because there was like no words level one. So if you get ganked or something, you're just screwed for the whole time. And it was just like frustrating to play top lane. While AD carry, you have your support. You can get like vision control around bot, and you just all you do had to do is farm and carry. And back then, I just like farming and carrying, so I just like that row. So I think if there was a team I could play AD carry on, I might be playing AD carry on, but it just changed. So let me ask you this then, because you have to remember the order that you joined Cloud Nine. There was a period where Wild Turtle left them when you could have joined AD carry right before you got sneaky. You didn't want to try out then. You wanted to stay top lane. Uh, I don't think there was anyone that we could get for top lane oh, okay. other than uh, just getting sneaky. So that's why I just stayed top lane and we grabbed sneaky. Nice. This might sound like an unfair question because when you played with Smithy it was like way back, it was at season two. And people always did say one of the things about why that team improved, Vulcan, was actually that basically as Ix Smithy got better, then Ix Smithy and Manuka were really good and then the team became really good. So maybe it's a bit unfair because you didn't play with him when he became really, really good. But since you played with Ix Smithy before and then you played with Meteos afterwards, and at a time that was like the big debate, okay, everyone was saying in season three, who's actually the best jungler? You know, like the styles are quite different. Ix Smithy was like really gank heavy. Meteos was farm up. What, what do you think the differences between playing with the two are? I think the difference between Meteos and Smithy is Smithy will do whatever the team needs. Like he will, if he's like farming a camp and you ask him to come right away, he'll come right away. Uh, he doesn't care about how much farm he gets. He just cares about like trying to get lanes ahead and just like being really gank heavy, like just pressuring lanes. And then Meteos, it's all about efficiency, like controlling the game from how he wants it. Like just uh, timing ganks where he can get like all these camps and then uh, see if it's correct time to gank. And if, if he can't gank that lane or like if it's not the time, like if he wastes too much time ganking, then he just focus on like efficiency farming or else Smithy will like do whatever to like gank. So when you said there, the initial reason why you went away from top lane was like, well, like you have to buy wards, otherwise you're not protected. If the jungler doesn't come, it's easy to get 1v2'd. When you were playing with Meteos in the first season of LCS, when you guys got in and it was going really well, he was like an MVP type player. But famously, he was a player who just, he disappeared into the jungle all game if you were the opponent and you didn't see him until a team fight, it felt like. So what was it like to play with him when he was in that mode there? Like if you were someone who said like, oh, I need you to help me now, I'm getting behind in my lane, would he actually come? Did you have to just fend for yourself? What was it like? Uh, 
When I was play, uh, playing with Medios that time, it was uh, pretty much Medios were like, okay, everyone just survive and uh, get as much farm as you can. I'll like just farm up in the jungle, come out ahead of the other jungler. And if as long as you survive his ganks, then I'll come out ahead and carry like mid game or something, like dragon fight. So it's like, uh, okay, uh, I have like maybe like realm into like some other matchup. It's like, uh, I just, I'm just, just gonna try and get as much farm as I can without dying, like playing really passive, like like staying like 10 CS behind or 20 CS as long as I survive. And it, as long as I get like level six and we get to a team fight, we'll win. Just cause Medios is like super head the other jungler. Did it surprise you during that first split where you guys only lost three games total that more teams couldn't like figure out how to play against you? Like no one had a really good approach. Like I said, Vulcan kind of did like, like they had a Smithy who was really gank heavy. But in general, a lot of the teams, even if they got like the early lead, you guys always came back and won anyway, mostly won lanes. Is it, is it weird what, that no one could figure you out? I think back then people were just like weak laners. They didn't know how to lane correctly. And uh, people also didn't know how to team fight and rotate. So I think one of the reasons why we were so ahead because we always come out ahead and rotating. Like they might be stuck top lane or something, and we might be taking like turret spot or like rotating to dragons or team fighting. And then uh, even if we were behind early game, it would just come down to like team fight at dragon, where we have our mid game power spike and we just went off that and snowball. And other teams didn't know how, what to do when they were ahead to like to finish the game. So when we were behind, we just like stall and come out ahead eventually. So I think the reason why Vulcan was the only team to beat us because they knew how to snowball their advantage. Like if they get early ganks off and just uh, take off from there, then we just couldn't stop them. Who, who at the time was like in that season where in theory it was easy for you guys, who was the hardest top laner for you to, to go against in NA LCS? Who, who gave you trouble or could play well against you? That is a long time ago. We had like Nian Tonso, Dyrus, Benny, let me think who else. I think Voy Boy was still top then, was he? Was there anyone, was there anyone who gave you problems, do you think? I think uh, one of the top players that gave me a problem back then was probably Voy Boy. Because he would do something like uh, innovative top, something that I wouldn't expect and it would catch me off guard and he would like, when Voy Boy snowballs, he knows how to use that advantage. So when he gets ahead, he just keeps killing you over and over and it's like, you can't stop him. One of the things I always wonder about with top laners, because after that period, it became like very much like the teleport meta top lane. So when, when you had certain players who were amazing at teleporting, so like a famous example is Looper from Samsung White. Well, actually, since he left Samsung White and he went to this Chinese team, suddenly his teleports got really bad. People say, oh, well, that just means then that his shot caller just told him when to do the teleports, basically. Like, and if Mata, whoever it was for his team, said, like, right, teleport now, then he just obeyed the command. How much in Cloud9, how much of the shot calling was, like, deciding when you did teleports? How much was it, like, you create a situation? Or did they tell you, like, come down now? Um... The shot calling for TP is usually like depends on when I can TP, but before then, uh, Hai used to be the one to tell me when to TP because I would like talk with him when I can TP, and like I would tell him to like put down a ward and tell me the exact time to TP. Okay. So I communicate with him, but now it's like me trying to communicate with Bali and, and Medios whenever I can, but I'm just uh, waiting for top lane, and sometimes it's like instinct when I can TP. I just like. TP down, but like, uh, it, it's way easier if you communicate with your team and if they can tell you when to TP exactly because they know if the TP can work or not. Okay. If you go into like the season after the first one you had, so the spring split of last year, season four, this was like an interesting period in time, I thought, for your career, because before then, okay, people looked at Cloud9 and they saw like, okay, Meteos is like the star player, and then they saw maybe High has like, had like a crazy playoffs or something, but it felt like the beginning of that season was when like Balls was like one of the main carries of the team. And I even noticed it felt like every game, early game was always you and Meteos. Super early on, get a gank off, take the first tower. Was this like an actual conscious decision in the team? Like there was gonna be more focus on you? I think at that time where uh, I was uh, rising up, we had a plan to like, I was playing Renekton or something, we had a really aggressive uh, early laning phase where if they're diveable top, media just comes top, we get a free kill and we just snowball off that. 
and uh, it was really coordinated. That's what we did every, a lot of games, and it worked. But then uh, I think Renekton started falling off. Then uh, I would have to play a like, Rumble or something, and uh, the plans changed from there. One of the interesting things about how that changed as well is, like I say, Meteos was the one really early ganking for you. And before then, that was like the opposite of his style. And what people criticized about him was they said like, oh, because he only plays that farm style, like it's kind of obvious what he's going to do to the enemy. But that season, he really switched it up and he kind of became like Smithy style almost. He was really gank heavy. Was, did the team itself ever sit down and like think like, oh, we have to go this route? Did he just decide it himself? How did that happen? Well, I think the split before, the farming tactics started to not work anymore since people were like ganking a lot. We weren't getting enough pressure and like we couldn't survive it anymore. So Lee Sin became really popular in that era and Meteos picked up Lee Sin and just like, Lee Sin is not really a farmer, he's like a ganker. Sure. So he had to change his play style. And we talked about it and since I was playing Renekton top, Renekton can set up the lane really well. And Renekton is really aggressive, wins lane against most matchup. And since Renekton and Lee Sin is really good at diving, we just set it up and it just works. When I did an interview with Skara way, way back, it was like at the, after season three Worlds, I was asking him about like Cloud9 because you guys had just come up and you had this crazy season. And I said to him like, oh, you must know all those players from solo queue and scrims, like were they always that good? And he actually told me that the player who was really not that good was actually Meteos. He said when he first got into our team, like Meteos's ganks weren't that good and High would just die all the time. Like I think it was the two of me said, High and Meteos were the two that weren't on the same page at all. And obviously later on, now they became the shot callers and they worked really well in your team. Was there like a, on the surface, it looks like Cloud9 was just always good. Like you wrecked the challenges scene, you came into LCS, you were winning everything. Was there actually like a process behind the scenes where things had to build up and you had to fix things here or there or decide how people are going to play? Were you that good from the beginning? Uh, at the beginning, when we just started, uh, our, our synergy between mid and jungle was actually not that good. Like they would have a lot of arguments on what to do and stuff and high just switch from jungle to mid. Yeah, yeah. So he was still learning his limits on what to do in mid. So he, had, so he just starts off dying a lot. And then uh, Meteos, it was his first time on a team like us. And like uh, Meteos' opinions about how to play the game was different compared to others. So it would just uh, stir up arguments. Okay. And then uh, when that happens, we just didn't know what to do in those kind of games. So it looked bad at first, but then after playing a lot of games, we Kai's shot calling became a lot better. His laning phase became a lot better. And then uh, Kai and Meteos like, came to agreement of what to do on our resources and it just went well. So that's something I read in an AMA. It said that, okay, the breakdown was like, Kai was like the ultimate shot caller. He had like the overall opinion, but if it was like an objective, like Dragon and Baron, then Meteos had like some element of shot calling. Did, did you literally sit down and have a decision like, okay, Kai has like the final word, but you can say this here. Was it broken down? Was it just naturally developed? How did it go? Kai was the definite shot caller. Like Meteos uh, gets to time buffs, objectives and tell us when it's up and went to go for him. But Hai is uh, the one voice that we all listen to no matter what. Like, if he says uh, we don't fight it, we don't fight it. If we're going for it, if we want a team fight, then we go for it. Like, whatever Hai says, we just follow no matter what. And as long as we all trust him, it just works well. If it doesn't work well, then we know it doesn't work and he'll make the better call next time. So, one of the things that you are most famous for in your career is obviously playing Rumble. Now, in the early days, when it was the first couple of splits or so, and you were playing this champion, it's understandable, like people don't know you that well in LCS, or maybe because at the time, Cloud9 had like a unique pick strategy, you used to play a lot of the same champions. Maybe they don't just focus that. Once you got this like record that started to build that, where you're undefeated on it, you won what, eight games, 10 games, it's building up like this. Did it surprise you that people still just gave it to you? That people didn't just auto ban? Um, uh, after a while, when I go like to 8-0, 10-0, whatever, I expect them to ban it. There, there's like a phase where Rumble is not starting to play, get played anymore. And maybe I start playing like different champions in scrims and people are like, uh, don't expect me to play Rumble. Okay. Or sometimes like, I expect that I don't get Rumble sometimes, so I, I expect it to be banned, but it doesn't get banned. And so I picked them. But like, there's always that one chance that Rumble is not going to be banned and that I might be able to get to play him. So 
I don't know what to expect. In general, is that your approach though? Like, let's say, let's say Rumble's not super meta champion. Like, okay, it was a couple of months ago, but it's not so much now. Let's say it's not, and then let's say as a result, the opponents don't ban it. They think, oh, you're not gonna play it, you don't play it in scrims. Are you someone where if, if it's available, you still want to try and make it work there? Is there times you just wouldn't play it, you think? The only time I wouldn't play Rumble is if it's obvious like he can't do much anymore, like he's, he's just worse than like the top three chance. But if there's a chance that he's still meta, like his team fighting is still great and uh, strong lane still, then I'll always pick him. But if something happens like a super OP champion top lane that's still up, then I'll pick that over the over Rumble. When people see your your ultimates equalizers, and they've always been famously really good, like really good at turning team fights, were, within Cloud Nine, were, were they, was that champion just always good for you from from day one? With your particular type of team, do you need like a certain type of team to to make it work? You definitely need a team that can play around Rumble. Like uh, Rumble is really good in team fights if you make the other team like CC stun into the rumble ulti or like they fall into a choke point and uh it depends on what comp you play around but rumble can't work for just everything what are the like ideal scenarios to set it up if you want it to work for rumble to work you want a lot of cc with them and you want like not full ap damage comp so you have to work around that who who if you watch like Koreans or Chinese players, is there one that really stands out for the Rumble? There's a few that have like a specialists on it. Is there anyone you ever thought like this guy's amazing? The Asian teams that played Rumble really well was the Samsung teams when they were at like the prime. Yep. We used to scrim against both Samsung team and whenever Looper or Acorn played Rumble, it was just like, wow, that, that champion looks so broken. Like, the way they play it, like, they would uh, get level six on Rumble, and everywhere he goes, like, red buff, blue buff, wherever he catches you off, off guard and just ulti, he just kills you. And I think Acorn's Rumble was, like, almost banned against him every time. It's, like, the best Rumble in the world, I think. Yeah, yeah, people often say that. Um, when you went to the first world, season three worlds, but you only got to play one best of three, so you didn't really get to have that many matches, this was the period when a lot of people thought, okay, Cloud9 destroyed everyone in NA. Like, it's easy for them in NA, but because of this period and then some of the IEMs and stuff like that afterwards, everyone was like, oh, but the international teams, like, they, they can't succeed internationally. Did, did the team actually have to change anything specially to play international teams? I don't think there was much that we had to change. It was just that our picks and ban or our overall play just... Uh became worse when we played against better teams. Did you particularly, was top lane different internationally than it was when you're playing at home? Like, it, well, like when you play against Soaz and Darien, is it different to playing against Dyrus, Nian, whoever in the NNA? I think the skill level was pretty similar with all the other top laners that I played. I didn't feel, feel really overwhelmed. It's just that they just played as a team better. Some people think that, okay, the best chance for Cloud9 internationally was season four Worlds. Like this was the one where coming in, you guys had still looked pretty good in an ALCS. You got like a proper boot camp in Korea beforehand. And then this group stage, obviously, like you were able to beat Najin in a game. If there'd been a different bracket, if you hadn't had to play like Samsung Blue immediately in the round of eight, you, you think, how far do you think you could have gone in this tournament? What was realistic at the time? I honestly think if we didn't have to play against Samsung in the first round that we could have maybe made it to the finals because from our scrim records it looked like the Chinese teams were weaker than we thought and that it was possible for us to make it to the finals if we were in the other side of the bracket. When you got to practice in the boot camp, a lot of the tip players I've talked to, some of them would be like really shocked like okay in, in, in practice, this Korean team was like unbeatable, but then if you play them in the tournament, now it was different, like maybe it was possible. Was there, any, was there any weird team to play against in the boot camp who was like too amazing or really bad, but was actually really good? What, what was it like? Uh, I think Samsung Blue was a team that was like, known for like losing a lot of scrims, but when they play in a real game, they play a lot better. 
And then Samsung White was like the team in scrims that was like unbeatable no matter what. Like you scrim them like 20 times in a row, but you're never gonna beat them. And uh, in real games, they play different a little bit sometimes. Okay, more seriously, what, 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 how different? Uh, I think in scrims they go reckless, but in uh, and still like be everyone. And but in serious games, uh, they do different stuff. Like more serious, uh, better correct builds. So as I mentioned, you played against Najin. You actually played them in three games, and one was the tiebreaker game. So Najin had a very famous top laner, Save, and actually a lot of people thought because he's like a carry top. Okay, he's going to be the best top laner by far in this tournament. He should be everyone. Did you know much about him going into the matchup? What, what did you think of how you played against him? We scrimmed Najin a few times in Korea. Their style was watch would always gank top a lot and save with freeze or control lane really well to make it happen. So I think their synergy was really good. Save was like a really good laner and he would always come out for him. And if he gets ahead, he can carry the team. So. We knew a bit of his champion pool from scrims and uh, it helped us in the real game spit. When you guys got to play blue in that quarterfinal, a full best of five in theory, what, what was Acorn like over a whole best of five? What, what, what interesting things did you find out? I think Acorn played more team oriented champions. Like he played Rumble in one of our games against Maokai and save Usually he plays like Kel, split pusher. Save is more like a split pusher. He play like Cassidy, Kel, anything that can split push and then like just get enough farm to carry. Acorn is like a really good laner and team fighter. So he plays champions that can team fight really well and carry his team. At that tournament, the other big NA team, I mean, technically there was two LMQ was an NA team, but I'm, I'm, I'm discounting them for a second. So TSM was also there. And in theory, TSM got a lot of advantages in the group stage. Like they didn't get a Korean team. Then SK only had Svenskeren for half the game. So it looked quite likely TSM was going to get out the group anyway. But they did manage to beat Star Home Royal Club in one game. But then they had to play Samsung White. And even though I always make fun of them for saying like, oh, we, if we'd played anyone else, we would have gone to the final. It's true, they did play the best team and a really, really good team. What actual level do you think TSM was like at that tournament? Like, are they exaggerating by saying if they'd played on the other side of the bracket, they would be in the final and they'd have definitely beaten, you know, OMG or Star Home Rollcup or whoever? Um, they, it's hard to tell if they could have made it to the finals, but it's definitely different if they weren't up against Samsung White. Those two teams were clearly like the best teams the whole tournament. So I think TSM and us were like, uh, behind them, like not close to them, but we could have done better if we weren't against them on the other side bracket. Okay. What about if, okay, then I've got this question for you. What if it had been the other way around? What if TSM had played Samsung Blue? Could they have beaten Samsung Blue? I think there's a chance that they could be Samsung Blue, but it's too hard to tell because Samsung Blue plays different in scrims. I think TSM said they beat Samsung Blue in scrims before, okay. but Samsung Blue is notorious, notorious for losing scrims. So it's hard to tell if they could beat Samsung Blue or not. So one of the international tournaments that Cloud9 won, I am San Jose. At this tournament, you guys got to play Alliance when obviously they were very hyped because they'd beat, or they'd played you at Worlds. They were the best team from Europe. In this, in this particular series, Normally, every time Alliance lost, everyone was like, oh, that wicked, he's such an idiot. Like he never plays meta champions, but this time he, he, it's like he bought into it. He was like, I'm gonna play Maokai every time. I'm gonna build tanks. So it was actually an unusual wicked. What did you think of how this series went? Well, I think I played really bad in that series and my team carried me because I was playing like Lissandra, Nar and stuff. And I wasn't really comfortable on those champions yet. Yeah. So I think I played really bad and wicked was just playing well. He was playing Maokai. I think Maokai was like the best champion for top. And I just couldn't uh, play well. And my team just, uh, just carried me. So one of the interesting things, like you mentioned there, was you were one of the first people trying to make NAR work, but it didn't go so well. But that's actually interestingly at the time, it's taken a long while before NAR has been used a lot. Like in Asia, it's used a lot. In LPL, they use it all the time. It, it, people always say you have to like play around now to make it work because obviously you have to wait for it to transform. 
have you got the hang of it now? You think if you're pretty decent now? Now? Yeah, I think my NAR is a lot better now. I think my team can play around NAR a lot more. But back then, it was like it was really hard to play with NAR, and people didn't know how strong NAR was back then. So uh, no one wanted to deal with NAR. So no one wanted to pick him up yet. No one wanted to spam him a lot. But now that people see like, oh, NAR is really good. Like he is really lane dominant and if you play around this rage he's like really strong so that that's why people just start picking up more at this last lcs final okay so the one a couple of time a couple of seasons ago was the three to two one where okay both teams could win this series it's obvious like the games were really close but this last one wasn't very close in the final and one of the things about cloud nine was in theory you guys always matched up against everyone really well you always found like a way to play against them what do you think the problem was with TSM now? What were, what were the strengths of TSM that were, were difficult to overcome? Uh, I think the strengths of TSM right now is the way they play around mid and just the fact that uh, Bjergsen can always take off after like small advantages and be able to like carry the whole game with shot calling too is uh, their biggest strength. Like just uh, one player being super good mechanically and the way they play around him is uh, what other teams just can't stop. One of the things people always said about Cloud9, because your lineup were all from America, everyone said, okay, that they're like proof that America still has good players. Like this whole lineup's really good, but then when you needed to recruit a player, you got a European player. So people are gonna say like, oh, you know, some of the other NA teams say, oh, there's not much talent in NA or there's not the right players out there. Are there actually players out there who you think like top teams like CLG, TSM, Cloud9, are there really NA players who, given the right chance, would make it? Is there a problem in terms of talent, do you think? I think if you give someone time, they could possibly be top. But like since uh, NA solo queue, no one takes it like seriously. It's hard to tell if there's talent there because uh, everyone just looks at other regions where EU solo queue is very serious. Like, uh, no one likes uh, losing. If you make a dumb mistake like split pushing for no reason, they rage at you for it. And then Korean solo queue, everyone's serious. And NA, if you like split push, uh, get away with it a little bit. But other regions, uh, they want to win so much that small things will just like uh, make them angry. When we talk about Dyrus for TSM, I want to kind of get your take on this because it seems like people have such extreme opinions on him. Either people say like, oh, he, he's terrible, like he's the reason they lose, like he feeds in lane, especially international tournaments, or they go the other way and sometimes they go too far, like they're like, oh, he's the ultimate team player, like, you know, even if he dies, that's part of the plan and he's going to get, he's going to be helpful in the fight at the end. W what is it actually like to play against Dyrus? Like, obviously, it's sometimes he can die and they can still win the game. The, the team's not focused around him that way. What, what do you think his strengths and weaknesses are as a player? I think Dyrus' strength is being able to farm really well. Like, he knows how to win most lane matches 1v1 by himself because he's, he's been used to being 1v1. So he knows how to play like most meta champions really well and farm like up to CS per minute. But I think his weakness is when he is left alone top and he pushes really aggressive, uh, that is punishable. Like if someone just comes top and gank him, then it's pretty much a free kill. And since they don't play around it like that, he just, uh, it's very easy to kill and then you just take off from that one kill. So another top player and I want to ask about Zion Spartan, because when he was on coast, okay, some of the players on coast weren't so good and as a team they weren't that good, so he was kind of like one of the bright spots, like he would have games where he was really good. Then he went to Dignitas and people thought on paper, okay, this can be like a very good team, but they kind of fell apart towards the end and he wasn't always the best player. Now in CLG, a similar problem on on paper it's like okay finally clg has like a proper carry top laner but he hasn't always managed to live up to that entirely is there something holds zion spartan back is it what do you think about his style zion's style is more about playing carry champions and just uh 1v1 split pushing and carrying the game but he couldn't do that because there's different ways like clg would play from like bot side and sometimes left up top side alone or sometimes the champions play doesn't fit in the meta anymore, like playing jacks. And I think that was just uh, the problems, like fighting meta champions and like 
being able to play them well. But Zion was... Zion knows like uh, how to play around his jungler. If his jungler ganks for him, he can take off just from one kill, snowball that advantage. And it just makes him like, where you see games where he would like 1v2 sometimes split push and just take off. And he just knows how to play around his jungler. Like if his jungler's not top, he knows how to play safe. He's just a smart player. Is there a, you went to some international tournaments, but first of all, if, you, if it was on where you lost out, like season three Worlds, you didn't get to play that many other teams. It's not like you got to play like SK Telecom at that tournament. Is there a player, a top laner in history that you never got to face, but you always wondered like, oh, if I had faced up against him, how would I have done? Is there one that comes to mind? We're talking about like season. A any any season, season, any region as well. Like even right now? Right now, even sure. I think the top player that I want to play right now is Marn. Okay. I always uh, watch almost every of his game. And I think uh, since Marin replaced Impact, that he must be like super good, like really good enough to replace Impact because I also looked up to Impact because I scrimmed against them in Paris, I think, and Impact mm -hmm. was like just really strong. And for Marin to replace Impact, that, mean, that must mean that he must be like way better. What do you think of Impact now though? Because it's one thing when Impact's on like SK Telecom and they're winning everything. Every, uh, all the players on teams that win everything and go undefeated are going to look really good. Now that he plays in NA and he plays on tip, what do you think of him now? Is he different? I still think Impact is really good. Like, I think everyone that plays against him in NA uh, knows how much pressure he puts. Does, does, when you played him when he was in SK Telecom, is he different in tip? Does he have to play a different way? What do you think? I think the difference between uh, SKT and Tip for Impact is just his team SKT was a lot better, and like probably management, management wise, and just like players overall. Okay. Do you have any final thoughts for people who watched the interview? Final words from Balls, a message for anyone? I want to thank HTC for putting all this together, and thank you for having me. No problem. Shep, I didn't see you there, man. That's all right, you get used to it. Tournament's pretty fun, right? Wait, what? All we do is stream games 10 hours a day in an empty house. It's great. No!